Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Harris Rosenzweig, Director of Accessibility for CCS Access. Uh, we have a bunch of people uh, who are still coming in. We want maybe leave a minute or two. I, I will um, take this moment to uh, have my, my colleague, Kevin, introduce himself. Hi, um, I'm Kevin Gummini, and I'm with uh, a company called MicroAssist, and I am the Senior Learning Architect there. Thanks, Kevin. And I also wanted to introduce uh, my colleague, Matt Belcher, our Director of Operations, who will be handling the moderating today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> a couple other housekeeping bits. Um, uh, while we're uh, waiting for some additional folks to, to come in, uh, we do have a poll that we have started, and I'm, I'm actually seeing the results of it come up uh, in front of me. Uh, there, I'll read the two questions. Um, one is, how would you describe your level of experience with accessibility? It's a multiple choice. <coughs> we had none, a little, pretty comfortable, or expert. And the same for, how would you describe your level of experience with e-learning? Uh, none, a little, pretty comfortable, or expert. Uh, if you are a screen reader user, uh, I did test this ahead of time. Uh, you can tab until you get to the questions and then use the arrow keys. Uh, they are radio buttons. Um, you may have to tab around again once you finish the first question to get to the second question. Um, so uh, we're still coming in. Um, wait one more moment uh, and I will probably just go through some housekeeping. Uh, as people are coming in, I'll repeat this again. Uh, we will not be attaching any files to the chat box. Uh, we had an unfortunate incident on a previous webinar uh, where someone came in, uh, attached uh, a suspicious file and asked people to download it in the chat box. So we will not be doing that. We will not, uh, do not, if anyone does that, don't click on it, don't try to download it. So I just wanted to, to say that uh, straight up um, before we began. Again, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, Creating Accessible E-Learning Environments in the Enterprise. Uh, we do have a poll up if you want to take a moment uh, while you're getting settled to uh, answer those two questions, it, it would uh, help us. Uh, just out of curiosity, Kevin, are you able to see the poll results? I am. Yeah, I can see them as they're coming in. We've got about 11 of 16 people have voted, and it looks like it's uh, on both questions. Um, on the question of how, which level of experience with accessibility, um, it's about mostly split between a little and pretty comfortable. And then how would you describe your level of experience with e-learning? Uh, most people are pretty comfortable with it. A few people are just a little bit comfortable with it. Got a couple experts out there, too. Okay, okay. Interesting mix, interesting mix. All right, so uh, I think I'll just start going through um, some of the additional uh, introduction uh, material and uh, some of the housekeeping while some additional folks come in. Um, so uh, we're very excited to have Microsoft with us today on this very important topic, which I, I really haven't seen anything regarding e-learning and accessibility out there. Uh, so very pleased to be joined with, with Kevin today. Uh, we do want this to be a conversation, not just between Kevin and myself, uh, but between you, our participants. Um, uh, so a little bit of background about TCS Access. Uh, we have been around since the 1980s. Uh, we've de dedicated to the advancement of equal access for persons with disabilities, whether in the enterprise, uh, in an education setting, or perhaps even one-on-one -on -one in the home. Uh, we're proud again to be a, a hosting this uh, important webinar, um, which is part of a series that we're doing on accessibility in this 30th anniversary of the ADA. Uh, some of our webinars are technically oriented, uh, whether it's on the accessibility of Microsoft Office, the G Suite on PDFs or web accessibility. Some are on general accessibilities for the uh, accessibility issues for the disability community, uh, like the one we did recently on the accessibility of voting for persons who are blind. And by the way, we're doing a repeat on that, a kind of an update on where we are closer to the election on October 22nd. Um, others are like the one we're doing today, which center on accessibility in the enterprise, whether in the public or the private sector. Last week's webinar was on the importance of the 
assistive technology assessment in the enterprise. Uh, we would like to hear from you as well, any other topics that you uh, would like to uh, see in our webinar portfolio. Kevin, if you'll uh, uh, take a moment to give us some information about uh, Microsyst. Sure. So Microsyst is an Austin-based company. We tend to specialize in training, especially accessible, uh, accessible training. Um, and when we're looking at e-learning, we do uh, instructor-led, we do e-learning, we do blended. And when we're looking at e-learning, we do everything from audit existing e-learning to remediate existing e-learning to where it's like kind of one of the best places to be is when you're creating a new accessible e-learning because then you can take care of accessibility right at the beginning. Uh, we've been in the business for over 30 years um, and I'm just incredibly pleased and to be able to be here. And thank you, Harris. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, T, uh, um, TCS Access for the opportunity to talk today, talk about this subject today. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before I just jump in here. Uh, throughout the webinar, feel free to put questions in the chat box uh, for you keystroke lovers out there like myself. Alt-H, uh, H is in Harris. Uh, we'll be checking questions as we go. Uh, Matt, Matt will be uh, uh, letting us know when, when they're there. Uh, we also would like to hear from your own voice. Uh, to mute and unmute yourself is Alt-A, A for audio. Uh, we do have live captioning going. Uh, if you click on the closed captions button and select show subtitles, uh, that's how you can access those. We are recording the webinar and we will provide the transcript and uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, I have the first uh, slide up on my screen here. Uh, and uh, where you can get all this good information uh, will be the end. Uh, so um, happy to be presenting uh, this webinar in concert with MicroAssist, our first hopefully of many joint ventures. Uh, we believe we have a very unique synergy uh, with our organization having a major focus on uh, what I like to call the last mile of accessibility, on ensuring a person has the tools, the assistive technology, the training they need, for example, to engage with one of these e-learning courses. And Microsys being the ones who can actually create a fully accessible e-learning experience uh, for you and your AT users. Um, so, um, with that, I, I'm going to uh, advance uh, our slide. Um, uh, looks like most people have, have uh, done the poll by now. Uh, perhaps we can end the polling. And I'm going to advance to the next PowerPoint slide. Uh, Kevin, if you want to run through uh, maybe our outline of the, the topics we want to cover today. Sure, be happy to. So what we really want, you know, we want to talk a little bit about um, if e-learning is, how do you know e-learning is usable, is usable by everyone? And, and part of that, uh, part of that kind of comes down to the need. Oops, hold on just a second, got to move something out of the way. Um, part of that comes out to the, to the need to make sure that our e-learning is reaching everybody, all of our learners. And we, uh, for those of you in the e-learning business, for those of you in the training business, you know, the primary goal of a lot of our efforts is to change learner behavior and it's to, um, uh, it's to change learner behavior. Um, it's to help people become better at what they do and not just the people uh, who are traditionally the audience, but also uh, anybody, everybody in our audience. Um, I can go into more of this in detail, but one of my particular passions is to make sure that e-learning training is available to everybody so they can become better at what they do. Uh, one of the common critiques about accessible e-learning and to a certain degree accessible web pages is that if it's accessible, it's boring, right? Because, oh, all you can do is put information on the screen and have a next button. I don't think that's the case at all. And I think we've had a lot of opportunity and maybe some of you, especially those of you who are pretty comfortable with accessibility and pretty comfortable with e-learning have also been able to find ways to make sure that e-learning is accessible and engaging. All right, it needs to be available to everybody so that, they, so that they can take it. It needs to be engaging so that we can change behavior. Accessible e-learning doesn't have to be boring, just like e-learning in general doesn't have to be boring. The third item that we'd like to talk a little bit about today is how you assess the accessibility of existing e-learning curriculum. I mentioned that I love to create from scratch. So I love to start with accessibility in mind. But the plain fact of it is a lot of us have dozens, if not hundreds of courses that already exist. And maybe we're looking at those and saying, oh my goodness, how do I know? 
if these things are accessible? And then how do I make them accessible if they're not? We also want to look at uh, if you're buying e-learning off the shelf, you know, we're six months into the pandemic. Um, I'm sure most of us have Would translated you need our- Would water coffee? Most of us had, uh, 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 most of us have transitioned from, in, in, you know, in-person classrooms to, um, uh, to, to, to virtual classrooms. Um, some of us might be looking at, you know, buying e-learning off the shelf to help with our training efforts. And if you do that, how do you make sure what you purchase is accessible? And then finally, this is what gets me, it, this is one of my first uh, experiences. So I'm always thinking about this. The, the first e-learning accessible course I designed, it was just brilliant. You could get everywhere you needed to go. You could tab, you could use your screen reader, you can get up to the resources section, you could access the resources section, you could download the resources and you can open up the PDFs and then you were stuck because I completely neglected to make sure that the PDFs, all those resources were accessible. So mm. hopefully you can learn from my experience and, and uh, ensure that uh, documents accompanying online training are fully accessible as well. Wow, boy, we have a lot to dig into here, uh, Kevin. I'm so glad that, that you're here with us. And also I love your statement about just because you have e-learning doesn't mean it needs to be boring. It doesn't need to be some sort of flat text file that is the equivalent facilitation of, of this uh, e-learning experience, which a lot of us are starting to enjoy as they get more interesting. Um, so, so absolutely, um, let me see my next, uh, I'm just gonna keep that up there at the webinar outline. Before we jump into the core of the of e-learning and accessibility, um, Kevin, if you can help us lay out what is actually meant by e-learning, what are we talking about here? What is the range of different programs uh, that people are using? Um, what is the prevalence of e-learning? What get kind of set the table for us? Sure, absolutely. And hey, anybody out there who's familiar with this, feel free to jump in the chat and add in some comments. Matt can read those to us. You know, when I think about e-learning, it it's just there's just so much of it because we, um, a lot of it is anything, and a lot of people when they're thinking about e-learning, it's anything that's delivered through, uh, you know, through a technolo technology medium. Um, so it could be something from a PDF to a learning management system. It could be a video. So we all looked at YouTube to find those how-to videos, right? To get a little bit of learning that way. Um, it could be a Zoom call like this, um, especially we're finding more and more as we've spent these past few months transitioning to kind of a virtual learning environment. A lot of this is live, it's in person. Um, I think one of the biggest things when I think of e-learning, I tend to slot it into these rapid authoring tools that are out there. Um, use these a lot. They're, they're really designed for people like me who, who, who have a, a pretty good grasp of instructional design and can handle a little bit of development, but is by no means a coder. So these are tools like um, Articulate Storyline. They have a, a group of tools. There's a Storyline 3, there's Storyline 360 that allow for you to create interactive e-learning. Uh, Lectora was recently uh, purchased by a company called eLearning Brothers. Um, it does the same sort of thing. Um, Captivate, you may be familiar with Captivate. Um, and the, this set of tools allows you to create e-learning that is engaging and that is interactive. The, the challenge with those tools though, is that they, they, they're really designed, they were initially designed to make things interactive first, accessibility came from the uh, came up later and I do want to give a you know shout out to Lectora and Storyline is getting so much better and making tools that you can then make accessible um, and make available so the training become available uh, to everybody uh, who you're uh, who you're working with so there's a lot and so e-learning can mean all these different things and, and of course when you're looking at all these different aspects of e-learnings each of them kind of takes its own particular twist in order to make sure that it's available, make sure that it's accessible. Yes, uh, I, I found that, isn't that just the case in, in most types of software? It's like yeah. accessibility has is, is always come, come later, but it is good to know that uh, uh, those features are being built into like a Particulate Storyline and, and those others that you mentioned. Um, what, one of the topics we've been talking about is you know, building this culture of equal access and one of the things I've always you know, wondered about, and this is, this is something a colleague of mine who's blind uh, wondered about uh, before I came up with this idea, 
where when you start a new job and you're in the enterprise, you have to take all of these e-learning courses, um, security or shelter in place or whatever it is that that organization wants you to take. Um, but there's nothing on disability or accessibility or technology and disability. Maybe what's built into your operating system. Um, there are so many topics that could help create this culture of equal access related to e-learning. And, and uh, I just never have seen that. That's a great point, Harris. Um, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. It's, it's the, the topics that are covered. I think places are getting better, but at the same time, there's still, still so much to do. Um, so uh, the next topic I wanted to uh, just briefly touch on while this is not um, uh, a webinar about uh, uh, accessibility laws and regulations, um, what, what, which ones might apply maybe at a high level um, uh, to the e-learning uh, situation? Yeah, um, so e-learning is kind of a funny beast, right? Because it can be documents, it can be a web page, it can be a web app. So it gets to be really complex when you sort of just take a look and say, what am I legally required to do to make e-learning meet these requirements? Um, I think it, it, you know, in terms of, uh, for federal agencies, of course, and I'm sure all uh, those out there that are pretty comfortable or experts um, at accessibility, you know, you're thinking, uh, you're thinking Section 508, absolutely right. Um, so Section 508 is very powerful. Um, the ADA also can apply to private organizations as well. It's a little bit less well-formed se than Section 508. There's attempts to kind of create some formal regulations around it, but at the same time, um, accessibility, um, according, to the, according to the ADA, um, is really done through a lot through court cases. If you're an educational institution, then sometimes you might be under a resolution agreement. What basically it kind of comes down to is, is people are generally saying, and I'm sure y'all are familiar with this, that we need to follow the web content accessibility guidelines success criteria, right? So it's web content accessibility guidelines or WCAG 2.0. We don't need to get all the technical. Uh, that might be a great question if we want to talk about it later, but um, level AA success criteria. And it's kind of like a checklist. You can think about it like a checklist. I think of it as a... Um, um, I, I think about it as, a, as, as, as something to help me, right? If I meet all of those requirements with my e-learning, then I, it could be completely unusable. Right? I think we've all kind of encountered that. You need to go beyond that. But I love checklists. I love lists because they take that load off of my brain and they put it someplace else. And so I know that if I go through this list, I can make sure that, that, I, can, that I can at least get that stuff knocked out, make sure that that stuff works. And when I think about e-learning, I, I tend to think about it um, just as, I, I tend to look at it as a web page. I mean, my, my general kind of assumption, and as we've worked with people with disabilities and they're looking at e-learning, e-learning is sometimes seen as its own special beast. So people recognize, hey, I've got to navigate this in a certain way. But sometimes it's just like when people open up, um, you know, people look at, the, look at email or they look at their computer and they immediately think it's a web browser. Right? They, they don't draw these distinctions that sometimes technical people will, will draw. So I look at an e-learning course and it's just a web page, right? And so I need to make it function as if it were to be, ex uh, uh, if, if somebody would ex were expecting it to function as a web page. Um, kind of rambled there a little bit, I think, but uh, hopefully that addressed the question. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really looking at those web content accessibility guidelines for the most part, uh, that e-learning environment. It's a little bit of a hybrid. Um, yeah, you've got you know, web design components in there. You, you maybe have a video player in there. I mean, all of that is in the WCAG or web content guidelines, yes. And, and I would say if you wanted to go a little bit beyond the WCAG guidelines or to look at a way, if you're looking at the WCAG guidelines and, and figuring out how to apply them to e-learning, because see, that's for me, it's always my question. It's like, oh, I love, I love it. And actually I love reading them. They're just so well thought out and just so detailed. It's just marvelous. Yes. But how do I apply those? And I found that if I go outside of my e-learning bubble and I look at like UX for, uh, for design or accessibility for web designers, accessibility for user experience, I find that there's a lot of people out there who have sort of like made that transition. And there's a lot there that I can take. And Absolutely. And, and apply it to e-learning. 
Um, guys, this is Matt. I just want to let you know we have a message in the chat window. It says, this is from Michael to everyone. It says, how does ATAG apply to, apply to articulate storyline, et cetera? That's a great question. So yeah, so that's how is how do the tools, um, how close do the tools follow the ATAG guidelines? Um, we've had some experience with that, but I'm not really in a position to talk in detail about that. So I think I'll, we'll need to take that question and kind of uh, maybe answer it later if we have an alternative to do that, Harris. Sure. Um, so uh, the the question for me is always, you know, there's there's all these explicit accessibility standards, the WCAG, and then there's usability. Yeah. Um, how usable is it? Something can be very accessible, but not necessarily very usable, uh, which is a whole other webinar under itself. Uh, for <clears throat> but I get the 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 main point I, I want to try to roll into here are the challenges, because not everyone on this call may understand what the challenges are, that. A, a person with a disability using assistive technology faces when they are interacting with these e-learning platforms. So we didn't want to, uh, we know there's a lot of people who are somewhat or fairly skilled with this topic, but we didn't want to gloss over this. Uh, this is something that uh, I feel is in TCS Access's wheelhouse. Um, uh, so when you, when you have someone um, with a disability using assistive technology, the primary issue is that many of these AT users, for a variety of reasons, find it very challenging or impossible to use the mouse to point and click. So think about it, folks. Um, if we took your mouse away, uh, and maybe we even took your monitor away, heaven forbid, uh, if you're blind, you're using a screen reader, how easy would it be for you to take those e-learning courses uh, that you've seen before? Um, Suppose we took your keyboard away as well. Maybe you're using voice recognition software um, and you're trying to go through that e-learning course that way. So those are some of the things that we're talking about here as to why there might be some challenges for people with disabilities. Um, so Kevin, um, based on like some of those kinds of challenges uh, where people either uh, can't use the mouse at all and they're using keyboard exclusively or they're using some other means. Um, uh, what are some specific things most e-learning courses should have in place to ensure uh, an accessible experience? You know, I'm going to go a little meta here. I think one of the key things that you need to have in place is a testing pattern. So it's less, sometimes it's less about the details because it is about the experience. I don't want to we talk about the details of, of how to make sure things are reachable by tab. Um, that's often very tool dependent. Great conversation to have. But I have found consistently that if we can establish a testing pattern, like what we're expected to do, what, what tools we're expected to use, and then also what, um, what we should expect to encounter when we're going through it. Like how should, if I have a drop down box if i've got a, if i've got a a, a drop uh, a multiple choice uh, a, a question that has a drop down selection how should that behave what keys should do what if i know that if i've got a layout as we often have in e-learning where we've got navigation buttons at the top we want to have a skipped content button we want to have menu we want to have back and next buttons at the bottom if i know how the keyboard should navigate those areas i am so far ahead of the game Right, so I have, I have, what am I gonna test with? You wanna go through and use a keyboard, make sure you can go through your entire course with the keyboard alone, not touching the mouse at all. Probably the lowest hanging fruit that you can do, if you can accomplish that and access everything you need to do, you are, you're doing, you're doing well. We're not screen reader experts, but we do find that it's helpful to kind of try to go through a course with the screen reader using very simple test patterns. To, uh, you know, stuff like that catches, I, you know, I'll tell you what it catches, it catches bad alt text. It's like, because, you know, technically, you know, you drop an image in at the last minute and it keeps the image, the image uh, file name on there instead of using appropriate alt text. You really kind of encounter that when you kind of go through. But I think the key is to have these testing patterns in place. We draw ours from our audit team. 
so we know what they're looking for. Then they go to our developer team. And in our developer team, uh, if everybody's consistent, not only does it create an end user experience that's functional, but it also helps keep peace in your development team. Because I tell you, nothing gets people more frustrated than when you say, well, when I tried to do this, it didn't work. And the, the first person says, but you didn't tell me it needed to do that. And you kind of go back and forth until you're uh, all on this. And, and then, you know, hopefully you'll all get on the same page. So kind of a roundabout answer, uh, Harris, but I think that if you can, if, if you're looking at, if you can work to identify on a high level, the behavior that you're expected, and then it becomes an administrative question of how do I enforce those, and I know enforce is a strong word, but how do I ensure that people follow and I can validate against those testing patterns, then, um, then, then, then you're going to have a good overall experience. In particular, uh, the two uh, the two main tests that we do, well, the three main tests that we do is we do a color contrast. This is like part throughout the entire process. process. We do a color contrast test of all of the text against the background and the images and the graphs and all of that kind of fun stuff. We do a keyboard test. We establish a, a tab order pattern. Now, e-learning can be kind of tricky with that, right? Because sometimes you'll have things um, that are scattered over the page and you're doing that for various reasons. Like you want people to, to, to access um, uh, certain like tabbed elements. You're kind of moving around. It does become a judgment call. You need to have a rationale for that. So it's never hard and fast. But we, have a, we, we try to establish a general tab pattern that also helps. Sorry, I will go on all day for this if y'all haven't figured it out. But it helps if you... Um, uh, it helps also for learners, right? If, and this is not, this is, this is for everybody. If you keep your navigation pattern consistent, it's good for everybody. It helps people who are using the navigation, just like web pages, so that you can kind of go through and know where everything is. But also if your navigation pattern is consistent, that means people aren't thinking about how to get to the next page. They're not thinking about how to open up that button. They are focusing on your content, which is what you want them to do. And then the third uh, kind of test that we kind of go through is do a very simple, low-level uh, uh, screen reader test, recognizing that people can customize screen readers and there's levels of expert use that we're never going to approach. But we do want to make sure that it has at least a, a rudimentary functional pattern as we go through the published course. Great. Um, so, uh, yeah, you mentioned se several really key things there, having a pattern uh, test results making sure that, that there's no surprises here that on the, maybe this particular page, this is how you interact with a question. And on this particular page, you're gonna to have to interact with this question in a, using a completely It's a multiple keyboard. choice, but, you, but, you, but you, you access it in different ways. And that can just be so confusing. These are excellent tests that, that anyone can do. Um, you, know, you mentioned color contrast, making sure can, things are accessible through the keyboard. Uh, your, your tab order, like when I hit the tab key, a lot of people don't realize that that's going to move me from one maybe question to the next question. Like we have the poll in the beginning of the Zoom or shift tab uh, will move me backwards. Uh, having that, that, that consistency um, and the tab order uh, if, if that person's using a keyboard. Um, and one other question, then I want to kind of turn it over, uh, ask the participants to chime, maybe chime in. Uh, and, and maybe uh, this is just a restating. Um, so if I'm um, uh, an enterprise uh, organization, uh, how can I uh, assess or figure out if, if my e-learning platforms are accessible? Um, do, I, do I do those things that you just mentioned? Um, uh, should I just call you? And we'll have your information at the end. It sounds like they should definitely call you anyway. Well, of course, you should call us to give you a hand. Absolutely, we love doing this. This is our, this is what we do from day to day. Um, you can do a lot of this yourself as well. But the nice thing about getting a professional audit done or professional uh, remediation done of your e-learning or getting a professional VPAC created of your e-learning is then you have an external organization that validates your approach. I know that uh, when I'm working with clients, one of the things that I love and am terrified of 
is sending, when I'm working federal clients, if there's if, uh, federal agencies, if they're sending the e-learning that we create to their section 508 office. I'm terrified of it because I never know what they're gonna come back with. I always try to plan ahead. But the thing I love about it is it's that external validation. Um, so you can within your organization absolutely do this, do this stuff yourself. And there's nothing easier than going through it with a keyboard. Fixing it, now that can be a challenge. Um, you can go through it with a screen reader. Those are pretty easy to get a hold of, at least on a very basic knowledge level. Um, but if you're going to an external uh, place that can validate or give you a VPAT, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll identify which, if the standard that you're measuring against is WCAG, for example, they'll identify which success criteria was tested, whether it tested that or what, and it, whether it passed and whether it didn't pass. And then if it didn't pass, often they'll offer recommendations about what you can do to, to, to help it pass. And then the brilliant thing about this is you can take all of that knowledge and fold it into your next e-learning course. So you're that much further ahead of the game. Mm. Um, one of my great frustrations, uh, uh, one of the jobs I've had in, in, in my career is to be a reader. Um, and typically we're, called, we're brought in to different federal agencies, different organizations, uh, because the e-learning is just not accessible. Yeah. So you have to hire another person to sit there and read the screens um, because it's just not accessible. And that's a pretty expensive uh, solution, uh, if you ask me. It is, and, and I do wanna be entirely upfront. I mean, the tools are good. Uh, the automated tools are good, but they're not perfect. And sometimes, you know, you can have e-learning that meets all the WCAG success, success criteria, but if it's in a learning management system that isn't accessible, then it's kind of cut off from you. So sometimes, and I was talking with somebody, I think they were at the University of California, and they said, you know, what we like to do is we recognize that we're not going to be able to make the perfect experience for everybody. But the goal is to get it as good enough for most people so that those people who call in a reader or who need that extra help to get through the course, you can reduce that level of frustration to make it easier to get through. You still want to always have that escape hatch that if you need that assistance, it's available. But there's a lot we can do on the front end to reduce the need for that assistance. Okay. I want to give uh, a chance for our participants to uh, chime in, uh, unmute yourself with Alt-A if you want. If you want to ask a question uh, or if you feel more comfortable in the chat box, just want to give a, a minute or two. Any, anything we've covered so far, um, uh, any questions that you might have you want to pose to Kevin? Give it a moment there. Don't be shy. Hi everybody, this is Michael Snellenberg. Hey Michael. Um, wanted to get an idea. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords flying around in the, in the training world on frameworks that's out there like UDL and that kind of thing. Um, is, there any, is there anybody building a framework like UDL that facilitates accessibility at this point? And, and can you... Uh, yeah, Kevin or, or Michael, define what is UDL? It's like um, university, uh, universal design language for learning. Yeah, I tend to think about it as universal design for learning. You know, let's, let's yeah, make exactly. sure that it's, yeah. And uh, I, I don't know that I've come across um, people building that ex specifically for e-learning. Um, that's not to say it's not out there, it's just I've not come across it. But I do think, I love that you brought up UDL, Universal Design for Learning, because I think there's a lot in there that we can put to use in the e-learning world. Universal Design for Learning is basically the idea that people learn in multiple ways. Uh, not so much learning styles, I don't want to get into a fight with anybody, but learning styles don't really exist. Um, but people have learning preferences. But, uh, but learning styles, but they're not really designed for learning styles. What you're doing is you're designing for multiple modality. My favorite example for um, universal design for learning is like information in a graph. You might have information in a graph uh, that can also be expressed as a table and that could also be expressed as a description of what the information means. 
Which one should you choose? Universal Design for Learning says you do all of them because you don't know how it's gonna work best for somebody. And I think this merges with accessibility because then you know somebody who um, would uh, can't can't visually see a chart and get that information, they might be able to navigate a table. For somebody who has difficulty kind of cognitively processing the information in a graph, maybe a table would be easier, or maybe the maybe the the explanation of what the meaning of the data is. So not to kind of latch on to universal design of learning specifically, because I know your question was broader than that, Michael. Um, but I do want to kind of say that, that that's a great framework. And it also points out to what I find in all of this, because Harris mentioned it's kind of hard to find information on accessible e-learning. I mean, it's out there. There are people who are talking about it. There are people who are thinking about it. Uh, Diane Elkins is a great person to talk with if you want, uh, if you're thinking about um, uh, accessible e-learning. Um, and then you have people like uh, Connie Malamed, uh, who focuses on instructional design, but then she also has an interest in accessible e-learning. Um, but what is always really kind of neat is in this nexus of technology and training, you can then branch out and find things that give you a, give you a new perspective on what you're doing. So um, you might, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier, you might look at the, uh, the user experience community and see what insight that gives you. You might look at the academic experience and look at universal design for learning and say, how can I take this to make the e-learning I'm designing to be more accessible, also to be more engaging, also to be more interactive. And I would chime in, make, making sure people with disabilities or assistive technology users are in that process. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're giving you that feedback in this yes. very interesting world where we have kind of accessibility blended with best practices in instructional design. Um, it's, it's quite a skill to, to kind of have those two blended. Um, so. And just building a little bit on that, Harris, a colleague of mine always used to say he, I, I love the way he phrases. this, he said, when it comes to accessibility, you know, we were dealing with cognitive disabilities, but instructional designers like have dealing with cognitive disabilities a lot of times just kind of built into what they do. Right? Because as a designer, I mean, you're taking things apart by objectives. You're uh, making sure that everything's aligned. You're, you're chunking your information to make it easily understandable. You're, you're using the language that's appropriate to the audience. You're making sure to define all your acronyms and your initialisms and all that kind of nitty gritty stuff. You're already doing that. So, so what we do as instructional designers, as learning architects, as people who are creating learning, um, I, think we, I think there are places where accessibility kind of already merges in, we can build on those, and there are places that we need to pay more attention to and, and, and build out in those areas. Great. Uh, um, Michael, does that, does that help with your question? Uh, yeah, absolutely, thank you. Let me take another question. Any other uh, folks want to just chime in? As you can see, Kevin has such an incredible wealth of experience on this and a passion for it too. So um, we will have his information yes. uh, at the end of this uh, for you to reach out to him and Microsyst. And I just want to emphasize, please do. I love talking about this. And uh, if you come with any questions after the webinar, happy sh you know shoot them my way. I'll be happy to talk with you about it. And we actually have a, a message in the chat window from Christy Adams. It says, and when they are blended, we get nice electronic curve cuts. Everyone benefits. Yes, that's a hundred percent. I mean, uh, when you think about like when you're designing interactive e-learning if you can make it accessible it's you know everybody a lot of people like Harris said a little bit earlier you know he's a he's a keyboard shortcut guy he likes keyboard shortcuts a lot of us do and it helps us operate faster so it's not just people who who uh, cannot use a mouse but it's also people who prefer to use a keyboard and the more we can do to get that level of technological frustration out of the way uh, i mentioned this earlier the more people are, are paying attention to what they need to be learning and improving and we uh, actually have question. another question if you have time for it yes go for it okay uh this is from kathleen but she's with uh, wells fargo it says what is your favorite tool 
Let's see, what is your favorite tool for building accessible interactive tutorials? <gasps> that's a, oh, that's, that's a great question. Hmm. You know, if Uh, have to have to it it, it, it kind of depends on what the what the output is i think it's it's a fantastic question i've i've been a user of storyline since the beta days so i'm really comfortable with that tool and i love the strides which i see storyline making in terms of accessibility so if i can i'll do that at the same time it seems to have difficulty they're getting better all the time but some of those technical areas in WCAG 2.0, they have difficulty with. So if I can, if I'm focusing on building an easy to use experience that needs to be accessible, but doesn't need full conformance, that's often what I'll do. Um, I also just think it, you know, it, it looks and it acts sharp. On the other hand, uh, if I can work directly in an LMS, sometimes that's best. Like an LMS like Moodle that's been, Moodle's, Moodle's pretty good out of the box, but then you can augment it a little bit and make it even more accessible. Um, and then you can build it directly, directly in your LMS and there's a lot of great stuff to do. I was just working on um, designing some uh, 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 interactive videos in Moodle um, that could, that you know, screen, uh, screen reader could use them and access them, keyboard accessible. And I find that was really kind of a powerful tool to use. So I wish I could say I have a favorite, but there's just, there, there's a lot of good things out there in a lot of these tools. Mm. And, and by LMS, uh, we're talking about learning management. Learning management systems. Yep. Thank you. Good catch, Harris. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so um, we do have some some additional time here. Uh, I have a, another question or two for you, Kevin. Uh, so suppose I, I have an existing e-learning course, which I might not have been fortunate enough to have gone through your company first, MicroAssist. Um, uh, and like, oh boy, I'm finding some issues things that need to be retrofitted, remediated. Um, uh, how hard is that to do? Well, first, let me say, if you do have something that needs to be remediated, please send it our way. We're happy to take that on. But you can also take it on yourself. Um, it, is, it is more difficult. Uh, I'll, I'll, I've, I said this earlier today, but um, I want to stress it. Your best bet is always to incorporate accessibility from the very beginning because then you can make sure that things like your color schemes are working, then make sure that any interactions that you're choosing to help learners master the objectives are accessible. It's always best to start with it in mind, but the plain case of it is sometimes we're not able to do that. It depends on how much freedom you have with, your, with, your, uh, with the existing e-learning. On the one hand, if you have the opportunity to rebuild it, that's a viable option. If you've got something that was developed, maybe you're going back, you know, years and you've got something in Storyline 2, which has problematic, but you can rebuild it because your organization has invested in Storyline. You can rebuild it in Storyline th uh, 360. That's an option. If you've got something in an older version of Lectora, maybe you rebuild it in a newer version of Lectora. We can get to the place, and I've, been, I've worked on projects where I have where, because organizations make investments in tools and they make investments in training, and they make investments in people, and I've got Storyline 3, and that's the license that my organization has, and all of my people are working in that for a lot of good reasons, right, so we can hand off our Storyline files and all that kind of good stuff. You can take it, and you can do things to make it more, more uh, accessible. There's some, um, it depends on how you're dealing with um, some, you, you avoid some interactions, and you you rebuild, and I think that's kind of key as I'm talking this through. Make sure that uh, it becomes challenging. I think, I think the biggest thing is, is if you or your stakeholders can be flexible in the adaptations that you can make. For example, if I've got an interaction uh, measuring, I've got a knowledge check that depends on a drag and drop, older version of Storyline relies on the mouse, can't really do that, right? This never make it. So I might need to reinvent that as a multiple choice question. So if I can do that, if I have the freedom and the ability and the flexibility to reinvent things as I need to and as I can, I think re, uh, remediating becomes an effective option. And this is, uh, let me, I'm going to build on that just a little bit more, Harris, because we've got, I'll try to keep it down to a minute. But um, the, uh, one of the things that we've kind of encountered is 
well, can I just make an accessible version of the course? And I'm sure those of you, especially those of you who have that pretty comfortable or expert experience with accessibility, y'all know the answer to this question right away. It's like, you know, maybe technically that's allowable, but you always really want to build it. Uh, you want to have one course for everybody that's designed to be accessible to everyone. And so when we are looking at remediating e-learning and when you're looking at remediating e-learning, um, I would strongly encourage you to try to avoid that accessibility button, right? You know, the button that you can click and then all of a sudden it turns off the audio and it takes you to pass you to different alternative interactions, right? See if you can avoid, sometimes it's inescapable because of organizational constraints, but see if you can avoid that and think about, okay, how can I take two steps back and just take all of those things and sort of reinvent the process and rebuild just those segments that, are inter that, are, aren't, inter uh, that aren't accessible in a way that, are, that, uh, that is accessible. Right, not a separate but equal um, exactly. experience, uh, which drives me crazy. Which not only drives, I mean, it drives the users crazy, it drives developers crazy because now if I'm designing a, 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 a standards-based course and the standards are updated, now not only do I have to go and update my e-learning course, now I got to update every version of my e-learning course that I've made as an alternative. So the more that we as designers and developers uh, can think about and stay within that single path uh, for everybody, the better it'll be. Okay, um, there's actually another question from Michael in here. A couple more, actually, one just popped in after this, so let me get to Michael's first. Um, it says, with Articulate Storyline and other training authoring tools, is there a templated approach you can take to build accessibility for a cross-team accessibility strategy to, to create accessible content? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. It says, with articul articulate storyline and other training authoring tools, is there a templated approach you can take to build accessibility for a cross-team accessibility strategy to create accessible content? That's uh, one, congratulations, Mike. That is just a fantastic approach. I mean, this idea of let, let's, let's work from templates. It's the same thing as designing for um, like web pages. You, you have a set of interactions that you've designed and you've built so that you know that they're accessible, right? And then you just do variations on that, um, on, those, um, on those interactions. It's, it's a great way. It helps speed up development and it helps make sure that accessibility is easier. Um, it's been a while since I've looked. I've not seen uh, template libraries that exist with that idea in mind, but you can build them yourself. Or as you know, I might say, you can come to Microsystem, we'll be happy to build them for you. But you can really build these for yourself. It becomes a matter of, um, of building out something, calling it a template, and then it becomes administrative enforcement. Because one thing I love about instructional designers and developers is they're always pushing the boundaries, right? They're always trying to improve things, trying to do this new interaction. And one of the strong, one of the most difficult things is to, is to sort of say, that's great, love the initiative, but for this course, we need to stay within this boundary so that when we output it, it is still accessible for everybody. So that's a solid, absolutely solid idea. Um, uh, wholeheartedly endorse it. I've used it um, in Lectora. I've used it in Storyline. It's a great approach. Um, and it is something that you can, you can build and, and administratively work with in your organization. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Harris, I just, uh, this question from Bruce. I actually would like to direct this to you. Yes. One of the biggest things we start with is knowing what is expected behavior to a user of a screen reader as opposed to something that is unusual or therefore not useful. As a sighted person, I, I don't know what best, excuse me, as a sighted person, I just don't know how best to put myself in their shoes. What a, what a fantastic question and, and something that's, it is in our, our wheelhouse. Uh, my colleague and I uh, just now are, are teaching a, a, a class uh, to a large federal organization on just this topic, on what is the user experience of a blind person using the JAWS screen reader in specific, um, it, is, it can be made more generic uh, to other screen readers, but what should you expect as you're tabbing through your e-learning program? What should the JAWS should be telling you? When is it, when does, uh, when is it the JAWS, the screen reader, 
uh, not giving you good information versus when you have encoded it correctly, um, <clears throat> which is probably something more on, on um, Kevin's side. But um, that is something that uh, we could help you with. Um, we do teach classes and in, in, uh, that user experience uh, of a screen reader. <clears throat> and let me endorse Harris on this. I mean, TCS Access puts on some fantastic courses and they're absolutely essential. And when I've talked with developers, not just in my organization, but within other organizations that are focusing on accessibility, this question is one of the biggest ones that kind of comes up. I know I need to do this, but what am I supposed to expect? How is it supposed to work? What kind of testing am I doing? And what we often find is people go to the outside edges. Right, you know, they 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 really take uh, they 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 since they don't have the boundaries, they really push um, way way out um, in terms of uh, of of design and flexibility. So going to a class like Harris is putting on, just is is it would just be super to, to give that knowledge base um, and that certainty when you're going through your testing and your designing for e-learning. So we're doing it pretty pretty well on time here, Kevin. I had one last uh, major area that. I I think we said we would cover is um, uh, what about the, the supporting you mentioned in the beginning the supporting resource documents that you might create for your e-learning uh, not to forget those you know the Microsoft Office yeah. documents whatever documents you create what about those yeah you need a you need to factor those in um, I would also strongly recommend that you're thinking about that when you're starting your e-learning project and not just at the end because um, you know, there's going to be, if you have to, if, 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 um, if you've got PDFs uh, that are required resources or that are, that are included in the training that you're developing, that are existing, the, the tendency, and I've done this myself, is to put them off at the last minute. Let me focus on what I've got doing, then I'll handle those documents later. But if you can factor that in from the very beginning, I've got documents I need to deal with, put them in your workflow, get them started right away. And think about when I'm delivering this, what's gonna be the most accessible, usable end user experience. Sometimes we find that simple documents, maybe Word might, might be good, but when you get into complex documents, maybe you're gonna to wanna to generate that as a PDF and do a remediated PDF. If you're doing a PowerPoint deck, um, Ideally, you're making that, 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 um, that PPTX file available to everybody, right? Because then they can go in and they can zoom in and they can, they can do everything that they need to. Um, but sometimes you may be in an organization that says, well, if we do that, we're giving our, our, our knowledge away. We're, you know, we're giving people access to, to these elements that we don't want to. So we need to lock it down. So then if you can't deliver a PPTX, what's going to be your, 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 uh, your next step down? Maybe it is a PDF that's been remediated. So think about your end product where you want to go. And then when you're remediating those documents, the thing I always say is, look, the Word, um, Adobe, they all have built-in accessibility tools. And you never want to rely on automated testing, right? Because it's just not going to catch everything. But you know what it will do? Is it will say, hey, there's no alt text on this image. You know, it will say, hey, on a PowerPoint, make sure to check the reading order on these pages. It's that helping hand. I was talking a little bit earlier about checklists. You know, this can kind of help me get partially there. So you're still going to want to go through and do a manual check on your documents. But lean on those, those automated checks and use them for what they're good for. Don't use them for what they're not good for, like this human level stuff. It can tell you if there's a good heading structure, but it can't tell you if one of your headings is, uh, you know, you're, you've got a valid heading structure, but it can't tell you if you've accidentally uh, uh, tagged a paragraph as a heading, right? So, uh, so use them what they're good for, but then also go through and do a, a manual check. And, and think about that, just to reemphasize, think about that when you're starting to work on your project don't don't put it off to the end couldn't agree with you more the the importance of all of those supporting documents uh, whether it be microsoft office base uh, google docs base for pdfs um or otherwise uh, to be accessible and that's uh, something else we you know we've taught courses on as the user experience if you're an assistive technology user what what is their experience as they're going through a pdf form or a powerpoint or an excel a complicated excel how does, how does a, a blind person navigate through these different um, uh, uh, resource documents? 
and I'll, I'll jump on that, Harris, and Sarah, yep. on the other end, MicroAssist teaches courses on if you're in the designing, uh, if you're making course PDF successful, if you're making PowerPoint successful, if you're making Word documents accessible, we have a suite of courses that, that teach you how to do that efficiently. Um, uh, I do want people to chime in with uh, questions that they do. I'm going to advance the slides over to, <coughs> Kevin has uh, nicely put together some additional resources uh, in the slide I have up now, um, <clears throat> based on Microsoft's experience here, uh, the next slide or two will have uh, where you can get uh, this information, the PowerPoint, the transcript, and the, and the recording uh, as well. Uh, but some excellent materials that uh, Kevin has put on the slide here and the links to them. Uh, I'll advance uh, one more slide here. Uh, just to fit in a bit about um, what we call our My AT remote services. These are on-demand remote uh, services that um, can be purchased right on our, our, our website in, in blocks of time, uh, whether assistive technology assessment is needed, training or support services. We do this for individuals, uh, educational organizations and rehab organizations, uh, workplace and enterprise. Uh, so we have the information on this slide um, our, our hotline, and we can get all that to you. I want to advance to this next slide as well. Uh, where to contact us? I, I have Kevin's uh, information. Uh, <coughs> K Gummini, uh, K G U M I E N N Y at microassist.com. Um, uh, that is where, uh, if you want to get the materials from this presentation, you should email. Uh, and there's uh, some other information about our company. And then uh, we have a slide um, with MicroSys contact information with Kevin's picture here uh, as well. Um, that's, the, that's the last slide there. So I <coughs> uh, would like to open it up. Uh, Kevin, if you have any other uh, remarks you wanted to make uh, in these last few minutes. Um, well, I think uh, I think we covered just a tremendous amount of material here. Just want to stress again, please reach out to me uh, via email, kgumienny at microsys.com, as Harris said. I'm always happy to, to talk with you in more detail about this. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank again Harris and Matt and TCS Access for not only putting on this webinar and making it available to everybody, but also just uh, just a helping give this subject uh, visibility. Um, E-learning and training in general, when we're thinking about accessibility, a lot of times accessibility become, is focused on those documents. A lot of times accessibility is focused on web pages and websites. But the training that's on those websites, the training that is available, that's available at an electronic format also needs to be accessible. Um, and there's, uh, we've made great strides in recent years about trying to figure out not only recognizing that need, but also and how we can accomplish and meet that need. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, uh, you know, so, so folks, uh, go to MicroAssist for all things e-learning, uh, uh, making them accessible, whether, whether it's an existing e-learning program you have or you wanna create something from scratch, uh, we know you're gonna get an incredible result if you, if you go with MicroAssist on that. And I'm, I'm really grateful to have Kevin on uh, with us, us today and, and hope for on, uh, in the future for maybe we'll do a deeper dive into specific topics or other topics related to this, which is such a huge area. Indeed. Okay, so uh, we can just stay on for a moment. If anyone uh, else wants to either chime in uh, with your voice or in the chat box. Uh, Harris, it doesn't like anyone is uh, putting anything in there. We're right at two o'clock, so um, okay. Thank you both for a great presentation. Yeah. Thanks to you, Matt, Thanks. for uh, moderating. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and thanks to y'all for attending. I mean, this is this is a great a great subject, and uh, so very happy to be able to to talk with and share these ideas with y'all. Good rest of your day, everyone. Take care.